and running uh, on a championship Monday. Purdue, UConn, number one versus number two, at least according to Ken Palm. And we've got ourselves a championship to discuss. Yes, the game will start at 920 Eastern. It has started that way for many, many years. So uh, leave your gripes at the doorstep. Never gripe about this gentleman right here. Jonathan Von Tobel. I am Tim Murray, and we are going to be breaking this thing down left, right, and sideways. Side, total, prop bets, everything you would like for the next three hours. As always, just a reminder, we are free on YouTube. You can check it out at vcin or youtube.com slash vcin live. JVT, how you doing, sir? I'm good. I'm fired up. It was a uh, it was a fun weekend of college and uh, professional hoops and baseball, and now we're finally here. And uh, I think I'm going to get the uh, the nice number that I want on. I'm going to officially say my boiler makers. That's boiler right. Boiler up. That's right. Boiler. I've been boilering up for a, a few rounds now. So why not just do it again? Can't we, wait to watch tonight. We were on Boiler Island yes. on uh, on Saturday. It felt like at least across the VSIN network. And uh, even though I thought like Purdue did not play all that well, uh, they were able to cover with uh, I'd say relative ease. Let it out as many as 20. Yep. And then UConn covering as well. So let's just look at the facts as we head into this game. Right now, consensus total sits at 144. So this has been on a steady decline. Uh, I did play under right when this game came out. Uh, talked about it yesterday on the Lombardi line with Ben Wilson and Mike Palm. Uh, but that number continues to drop. We will discuss that total here momentarily. But the spread, we'll call it consensus 7 uh, you can get a six and a half out there if you do like the favorite in UConn. If you like the dog in Purdue, you can grab a seven. Both of these teams, JVT, enter this game 5-0 and oh against the spread in the NCAA tournament. Purdue covering by eight and a half points per game. UConn covering by 10.8 points per game. UConn over the weekend as a 10-point favorite against Alabama, covering uh, that number by four as they won the game by 14. Uh, I would say for the Purdue side of things, it's a little inflated uh, because of the Utah State domination as an 11.5 point favorite. They won that game by 39 and that covered by 27.5 points. So UConn playing a little bit closer to the number than UConn has been. But still, both these teams through the first five games of this NCAA tournament have exceeded the odds makers' expectations, mm -hmm. but are you, JVT, paying a tax again on UConn? Felt like you were paying a tax when they played Illinois. Didn't matter. Paying a tax against Alameda. Did not matter. Interestingly enough, you and I both laid it with Purdue uh, in the final four matchup against NC State, and it felt like you were actually getting Purdue a little bit on sale against NC State. So now this number being at six and a half, seven, are you paying a tax on UConn. I don't really think there's a question about it. You know, when some of the projection systems that are the most respected have this is about a three point game, yep. um, right? That's telling you that, yeah, we're probably paying us like that much of a discrepancy at this point of the year between the betting market and where some of these respected projections are is pretty wild to see a near six point difference in those. So I would say I don't think there's really any question. Now, you can be paying a tax and still, of course, um, Get it handed to you, right? Because yep. UConn continues to cover uh, at a really high clip. But I don't think there's really any question that you're doing that now with UConn. And to kind of ignore, to a certain extent, what Purdue has done, I would argue, Tim, uh, that the road here from the Sweet 16 on has been tougher for a team like Purdue in terms of quality of opposition. I think that San Diego State really weighs it down for UConn because you and I both didn't really think much of the Aztecs as we headed into the tournament. But it's been impressive to see the market not necessarily sleep on Purdue, but not give them the the, the real respect that they deserve. And they've come in and they've covered every single one of these matchups as well. So, I, I, like I said, since that Gonzaga matchup, I've been in here on this Purdue team. I've been very impressed with what they've been able to do. And I think that they should be given just a tad bit more respect here. But you can't ignore exactly what we've seen through these first three rounds to cover the way that, of course, UConn did. As v at vsin.com, our betting splits, a very popular por portion of our website, completely free right now. You can go check it out, vsin.com, the latest uh, from uh, DraftKings Sportsbook every 10 minutes. And this shouldn't come as a big surprise. 65% of the bets, 71% of the handle right now at DraftKings laying it with the UConn Huskies. As for the total, this is interesting to note. 60% of the bets, 54% of the handle on Purdue. But we've seen this steadily decline. This thing opened, uh, if you go and expand the splits a little bit, 
uh, on VEASAN.com, you can look at the history. On Saturday night, when these two games concluded and they came out with the matchup, this thing opened 147 and a half. So it has moved four points to the under at some shops. Like I said, I was able to grab a 147 at Circa on Saturday night. So fortunate there as we sit with a little CLV. Uh, we'll talk about best bets and still how I would look at it. But, you know, I want to go through something that I kind of dug up a bit just using some Ken Palm numbers uh, earlier today. So UConn enters this game with just three losses on the year. They lost on the road at Kansas on December 1st. They lost on the road against Seton Hall on December 20th. And then they lost most recently, their only loss in 2024, against Creighton on the road as well. So they have not lost a game on a neutral or at home this year. But the thing that I found interesting is why I think the under is a look. Mm -hmm. You got to slow this game down. And it's not like UConn plays at a breakneck pace. They they slowed it down against Alabama. The Alabama game only had 63 possessions and it still sat at 86-72 by the way. Was an under as that game closed at 160 and a half from a total uh, from a from a pace perspective. But if you look at the seven slowest games they played this year, UConn. Games that had 62 possessions or less. This UConn team, 1 and 6 against the spread. Four and three straight up. All three of their losses have been at a 62 possession game or less. They lost their game against Creighton, a game in which Creighton was ridiculously hot from outside. 59 possessions in that game, 85 to 66, the final score. They lost to Kansas, just 60 possessions in that game, 69 to 65, and then they lost to Saint uh, to Seton Hall uh, on December 20th, 62 possessions. If Purdue is able to slow this thing down, play it in the half court, I personally think that is the best opportunity for Purdue to cover and win this game. So that's why immediately my eyes gravitated towards the under because I think that if you're Purdue, you're going to want to slow this down. On the flip side, if Purdue plays slow games, they've been okay. You look at first-round game against Grambling, 61 possessions, one in covered. Sweet 16 game against Gonzaga, 59 possessions, won comfortably and covered uh, that number as well. So for me, JVT, it comes down to pace. And like I said, UConn is not a team that is very uh, up-tempo. You look at some of their advanced numbers, they played at a pretty slow rate. But yeah, I think for for Purdue, in my opinion, you got to keep this thing slow. You got to play it in the half court and... And that's the best chance for them to cover. So that's why, to me, I think the under has taken so much money so far. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, it also depends on how you look at these things, right? So, for example, in those three losses, there's also another common thread, which is the three-point shooting your yep. opponents. Uh, opponents in the three losses for UConn shot a combined 52% from three. So that's going to kill you. A lot of the times it's a pretty high clip. Uh, Purdue just happens to be, are they first still again? Whatever, whatever. first, second, second. in three-point shooting. Six, yeah, yeah. 40.6. Um, very, very good in that regard. And a team that you know can shoot over the top, especially a team like with UConn, has a lot of size down low that you don't really need to challenge them outside of your best player yep. in Zach Eady. So that's another thing that I think does work in, in Purdue's favor is, to your point, if the possessions are low and that really correlates to a loss here or a field cover for UConn, you also get another thing that correlates there, which is opponent hot shooting, and Purdue can totally do that if that's going to be the case and negate some of the advantages that you have down low as a team. But it also helps, Tim, if you're not pressuring at the rim, right, miss shots within four feet, tend to rebound a little bit shorter. Longer shots tend to rebound a little bit longer, so you get your guards involved in terms of rebounding as well to help battle on the glass. I think that those are the kind of things you're looking for, not only a slow pace, but what do we talk about? How you spring up upsets? Slow pace, three-point shooting. Purdue can do both of those things. A lot of great guests going to be joining us throughout the show. Our best bets coming up. Bottom of the hour, as they always are. We'll talk to Adam Burke a little bit later on in this hour. Uh, Matt Grill from DraftKings Sportsbook to give us the latest from behind the counter as it'll be about two hours away from tip time. Where are they seeing money? What is their liability, futures market, and for this game? We will head to Arizona multiple times during the show. Jim Root live from Glendale, Arizona will join us at 7.30 Eastern. We'll also talk to Brian Newbert, who covers Purdue live from Arizona in the second hour of the program. Brian Butch, former Wisconsin Badger, Big Ten, uh, Big Ten Network analyst in the third hour of the program, and Justin Perry from Shock Quality as well. So a lot to get to from player props, from side total, all of that, JVT, as the show goes on. We also have a poll question today. You can always follow us on Twitter 
at me, JBT is where you can find him. At one Tim Murray is where you can find me. And uh, simply put, what's the most likely outcome tonight? Purdue cover, UConn win. Purdue win, UConn cover seven to ten points, or an alt line for UConn at minus ten and a half points. Right now, it looks like UConn win, Purdue cover is a slight favorite over UConn alt line right now. What did you play? Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta refresh that. I've got UConn oh, cover. UConn seven, cover. Yeah, I'm seven at, to ten point win. Thirty eight percent of the votes. Thirty eight percent. You know what I that. vote. You know what I voted. Purdue for. win. Yes, of course. All in. All in. All I've in always been here. I've, I even agreed with Jared the whole time about Purdue. I totally did. <laughs> Jared, Jared Smith out there. He was uh, he was the, the the believer all along in uh, the Purdue Boilermakers. So we will uh, take a look at all of it. As mentioned, we're free on YouTube this hour. YouTube.com slash VSEN Live. We'll keep you updated on everything you need to know for the national championship. Tip time anticipated for 920 Eastern down at State Farm Stadium Get in over Glendale, Arizona, Arizona. Your line right now at DraftKings, UConn minus seven. Total 143 and a half. If you do like the under, 144s are out there. A lot more to come as we break this game down. That's Jonathan Von Tobel. I'm Tim Murray. It is VSIN primetime on a championship Monday. is VSIN Primetime with Tim Murray and Jonathan Von Tobel on VSIN, the sports betting network. Just in time for the national championship game tonight, folks. Check out the betting splits data. It's free. Yep, no purchase necessary in terms of a VSIN Pro subscription. It's actually open for the next two weeks. So check it out now, vsin.com slash splits to get access to all the betting splits data courtesy of DraftKings. Take a look at it right now. 65% of the bets, 71% of the handle. Laying it with UConn at DraftKings Sportsbook. 60% of the bets, 55% of the handle on the over. And then money line bets, 61% of the bets, 65% of the handle. Taking the money line with Purdue. People want that bang for their buck. We've got our poll question up. You can uh, hit it up at one Tim Murray, also at me, JVT. Retweeted it. Most likely outcome right now, UConn cover by 7 to 10, covering 7 to 10 points. So no alt line. By the way, if anyone out, out, out there, easy for me to say, had a alt line in the Purdue game, I may or may not have laid 13 and a half at plus 180. God bless. 7-0 uh, run there for NC State to, uh, to close out the game. So didn't get, uh, didn't get everything home, but uh, still a pretty nice performance there. No NBA tonight as it is center stage for college basketball. Only two hockey games tonight as well. Uh, as for baseball, JVT, handful of games uh, going on throughout the uh, throughout the Major League Baseball Association. Nestor Cortez, that's your guy uh, that's right. on the hill against the Miami Marlins who will not go winless. So uh, congratulations to the Marlins. They will not go 0 and 162. No. And uh, you say Nestor Cortez, my guy facetiously, of course, because Nestor Cortez is a man that I believe is worth fading in these first five situations. But again, you got to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. Not today against the uh, hapless Marlins, I believe. So stayed off today. We'll see what he, uh, he's got going for him. He was really feeling himself after getting through the top of the first inning. So I guess <laughs> According to the Yankees' Twitter, everything's fine, and he's all fixed and ready to go. But uh, today was not one of the days, I believe, to go after him with um, one of the, I'll call it, lackluster lineups in Major League Baseball. Yeah, so uh, two hockey games tonight, handful of baseball games, no NBA games as they allow the stage to be college basketballs. Right now, we're sitting at seven, pretty much across the board. Circus sits at six and a half in favor of UConn. UConn, of course, has covered every single game in this NCAA tournament, as has Purdue, but UConn has won every game by double digits. The last two NCAA tournaments, they've won every single game by double digits. Even though I think, you know, it's it's fun to say, I like pointing it out, this year's UConn team is very different from last year's UConn team. Adama Sanogo was on last year's uh, national championship team. He won most outstanding player uh, of the final four. Jordan Hawkins was on that team, who ultimately was a lottery pick. Uh, and uh, and Andre Jackson as well. So very different team. Uh, I do really like the 
way that Stefan Castle has stepped up here uh, for this UConn team. We've got a graphic up for those of you watching with us where odds, uh, these are the bets and handle the splits, I should say, for mm-hmm. the most outstanding player of uh, the final four. Donovan Klingen is at two to one, 31% of the handle, 15% of the bets. I did see on our vcin.com slash picks page, Mitch Moss gave this out earlier today on Follow the Money, Donovan Klingen uh, to win most outstanding player. Is that the way to do it instead of betting UConn to win this thing? Do you just go Klingen? Is it his award to lose? I actually... Yeah, I actually think, and and one of my best bets coming up bottom of the hour might have something to do with Donovan Klingon. Is I think he has a tough one tonight. I, you know, it, does he get into foul trouble early? Is he needed for them to win this game per se? Uh, if you look at some of the matchups that he's faced so far this year with people of like size, and Zach Eady, of course, being bigger than Donovan Klingon. You know, Ryan Kalkbrenner, the Creighton games, he did not fare all that well from an offensive standpoint. So. Uh, I think Donovan Klingon, from an offensive standpoint, now defensively, I think he could certainly give Zach Eady some trouble as well, but I think Donovan Klingon struggles a little bit, and I think looking at the under is uh, is worth a little bit of a look here. We've also seen, though, and I, of course we'll never forget Ochak Baji winning most outstanding player when he didn't deserve it, right, is that generally names do win it. Oh, and, yeah. And, and Donovan Klingon, I think that's part of it too. Kling which is, Kong, baby. Yeah, and uh, play, right, the narrative of playing through the hand. Yep. Do we believe that, by the way? Or is this another uh, Hurley? Like, let's just uh, just wrap the hand. Just up. wrap it up. Just wrap it up. You're, you're, you know, we'll just let's just do that too. Um, but I, I do wonder how. Like, does he have the name brand recognition enough that voters still, even if he goes under, because going under your point total could also just be a symptom of a slow paced game, as we're yep. discussing, right? So if you if we get, God forbid, we get one of those sixty two sixty like clunkers kind of like really slow pace God kind forbid, of game. I think that would be tremendous well I mean yeah I, I mean you bet under and I have a producer I would like that too but <laughs> uh, I'm talking about the masses who was like yes. this is boring right but if we get one like of we those just saw games Purdue NC State yeah very ugly clunky game and if you get one of those games he still goes under but not by you know um by way of struggling yeah. but by way of game plan uh, and pace and tempo still could win this thing so I do wonder if people are going to use Klingon as the faux money line price or UConn. He seems to be, obviously, the favorite, the most correlated to that result. Uh, but I do wonder if any of these, uh, as a Tristan Newton, Cam Spencer, if anyone can come in here and steal this from him. By the way, are those, those can't be updated, right? Because Zach Eady at plus 175, that's that's that would be a horrendous bet uh, because money line on Purdue is plus 260. So uh, yeah. if, if that is the current price, please don't bet that and go bet them on the money line. Zach Eady will not win MOP. If Purdue does not win. So uh, if those are the current odds, I know JVT is searching right now through the DraftKings website. Do not place that bet. If you think Purdue is going to win. I just did a thing. Just bet them on the money line. So, uh, yes, I think from the UConn side of things, if you want to get a little creative, certainly as they said, as a minus $3 favorite uh, on the money line, you could certainly go a a different route there. Um, When I look at this game, and I know everybody's going to focus on the big boys. They are the two most notable players. Donovan Klingon for UConn. Zach Eady for Purdue. Zach Eady winning back-to-back Naismith National Player of the Years. He's been the you know go-to player, leading uh, scorer in the country. All of that. To me, it comes down to the guard play. And I think why I haven't fully jumped in on Purdue is I am very worried about how their guards are going to play uh, in this particular game. And sure. when you look at Braden Smith, I I am not, and we'll have you know Brian Newbert on later on in the show who covers Purdue. In Braden Smith's short career, I have not watched every Purdue game. I've watched a lot of them. That had to have been his worst game of his career. He was horrendous against NC State. Turned the ball over, what, six times in that game, uh, one for 10 from the field, hit that late three to maybe get the confidence going. So is this a situation, JVT, where you get a bounce back effort? I've seen a lot of people talk about Braden Smith over his pl- point prop, as we show it right there, 10 and a half. Is this a, a buy low opportunity on Braden Smith coming off of a dreadful performance? You know, Braden Smith is a guy that is a around 40% three point shooter and against uh, against NC State, he was one for five from long range. So do you get a bounce back performance from Braden Smith, who this year, 43% from long range, hit a couple of those threes, you're, you're over 10 and a half is looking pretty, 
obtainable. Yeah, it could be. And I I would say this, too. As somebody who, like, you bet the under, I believe that that's the way the way that this game is going to go, too. It didn't get in on a number, but I believe that's the way that this thing's going to trend. Um, really going to be a slow-paced game as well. So hovering around that, like, you know, low to mid-60s mid in terms of possessions. I think it would behoove you to still look under Braden Smith regardless of potential struggles. But I think this also ties into, as we talked about a lot, right, the performance of Zach Eady. If, Z, if Eady's going to be able to attract some extra attention to be able to kick it out to open shooters the guy who benefit from that would be Braden Smith to be getting a, to get an opportunity to not only write him uh, get open looks from three but if the rotation sound enough assist opportunities as well to be able to kick it to another open shooter yourself by ball movement so I do think that the if we're looking around at spots where I would go over I would look a little bit toward Braden Smith toward the over but as somebody who thinks generally this game is going to be pretty low scoring I think I'd rather stay away from something like that. It's a high assist total, too, six and a half. Yeah. It's quite a bit. And I think one thing that's that's intriguing, I saw a couple people, I know DraftKings ha- doesn't have it offered, but a couple other shops did. I think Zach Eady's assist prop in the Final Four against NC State was one and a half. Yep. I saw a p- bunch of people that I respect played that over, and it cashed as he had four assists in that game. I wouldn't be so quick to play the over in this spot because I truly believe that UConn – is going to trust in their big man and Donovan Klingon. Yes. I think there's going to be a lot of one-on-one. I don't think there's going to be a ton of help defense like we saw at NC State. NC State was harassing Zach Eady, digging down low, getting him to turn the ball over. Uncharacteristically, he had five turnovers in that game. I thought Middlebrooks played really well uh, against him defensively. Maybe not so much DJ Burns, but he got us that under. Um, but yeah, I don't. I would, if anything, I would be more inclined to look at Zach Eady's over. Because I think there's going to be a lot of one-on-one opportunities for Zach Eady, which I think, once again, plays into the slow pace. Feed it into the post. Let's let that play develop. And if they don't bring a double, you know, maybe you get a, a hook shot with that soft touch from Zach Eady. Yep. No, I would agree with that. Yeah, under one and a half plus 130 uh, for assists for Zach Eady. And I think that makes a lot of sense having confidence and just sitting back and playing one-on-one and cutting away those uh, assist opportunities. All right, best bets for the national championship coming up on the other side of the break. As always, we are up and running on YouTube, youtube.com slash Live. Adam Burke later on in this hour, getting you ready for the national championship. UConn laying seven right now at DraftKings. is VSIN Primetime with Tim Murray and Jonathan Von Tobel on VSIN, the sports betting network. Masters is coming up, folks. So get in on the action and check out our Long Shots Masters edition. It'll be out on Tuesday at 11 p.m. Eastern. You get odds on every player, best bet strategies, and more. And of course, for all of the coverage for the, what is it? What's the, what's the nickname? Run for these aliens? I don't know. VSIN.com slash Masters. <laughs> a tradition unlike any other yeah among the you? azaleas right yeah there you go yeah the azalea trees looks always amen corner green jackets nailed Vesta, it. you know it got Come it on. vcin.com slash masters check it out scotty scheffler plus 450 to win the masters minus 105 to go top five at DraftKings now you. right now Whew, man uh we will talk plenty of masters uh throughout the week get you ready for thursday and uh, as JVT alluded to, make sure you check out the long shots as well. Bob Herrig will join us tomorrow to preview the Masters. So looking forward to that uh, tomorrow. But today, all eyes on the national championship. But, you know, we got some business to attend to. Basketball, national championship, not the only thing on the card this evening. So let's do it, folks, as we do each and every day at 6.30 Eastern. Our best bets. I see you using an old style. I'm giving you the keys to the king. Putting our money where our mouth is. I like to live dangerously. It's time for best bets. Come on, Jerry. It's a lock. Love it. Love the love the ditty. Getting us ready. Uh, good weekend. That was uh, it's good to see as uh, we were able to uh, get some winners. DJ Burns under Purdue. Never in doubt. Boiler up. So uh, good weekend. Hopefully we can keep it rolling uh i will get to my best bets here momentarily but sir the floor is yours what do we got here for national championship and uh maybe a little baseball tonight as well yeah, let's get the baseball out of the way really quickly because this game's going to get started i think in i know this is a 420 but we get it out of the way either way uh we are getting spencer turnbull on the hill today here for the philadelphia phillies he'll oppose the st louis cardinals 
and Miles Michaelis. Uh, this is a play on Turnbull. It's against the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, but Turnbull's been pitching pretty well. And look, it's a small sample size. We're only talking about five innings of work. But numbers across the board pretty tight uh, in what he's been able to do. Generating swings and misses in that first outing. Kind of trust him a little bit more here than Michaelis, whose numbers have kind of been on the decline. And this year, through two starts, it seems that it's somewhat legitimate. Ten in the third innings, 6'10 ERA, 483 fielding independent. I do trust that Turnbull and this Phillies team is going to be able to take care of business here today against Michaelis and the Cardinals. By the way, Cardinals too, just throwing it out there, but their lineup kind of stinks so far, and I think that's also part of this against Turnbull. When when you're looking this early, Tim, and you're seeing that, all right, 25th and weighted runs created plus, but we're only talking about barely two weeks of the season, maybe there's some noise there. There seems like the Mets, for example, that on the surface look like the worst lineup in baseball, but if you dig just a little bit, you see that they're getting unlucky. Uh, for the St. Louis, that's not the case. They're not walking at a high rate. They're striking out at a pretty high rate. They have the seventh highest strikeout amongst lineups. There's no real buy signs amongst this lineup. So I think Turnbull's going to be able to come in here and have a pretty good outing, and they're going to be able to get to Michaelis. First five winner. So not just a uh, money line, but yeah, for, uh, ready the half run at plus 115 with the Philadelphia Phillies. All right, Phillies, first five. Let's get that one home. We'll uh, keep an eye on that as the show goes on. Seen a little bit of movement in the market here, uh, backing UConn as the six and a halfs have all been scooped up as it looks like market-wide we're sitting at seven. Yes. Total sits at 144. So I'll start with the total. I bet on Saturday night under 147. That number is obviously not available. So uh, I will still say a smaller play would be at, minus, at 144, but, uh, you know, not going to be in love with that play. Talked about it yesterday on VEASAN, uh, on the Lombardi line on Sunday. But uh, the other two plays that are readily available, we're going to go Purdue first half, plus four in the first half. I do think, as we discussed, the method to winning this game for Purdue is to slow it down, to play in the half court, to feed the ball into Zach Eady. The guards make me worried. This is a UConn team that has erased teams rather quickly in the second half. You saw that against Alabama. Game was tied up at 56. They go on to win and cover as well. Illinois, the, the unprecedented 30-0 run. So I do think this is going to be a slower-paced game. Kind of correlated with the under. I like Purdue in the first half, not the full game. JVT will get to that as well. And then I'm going to go Donovan Klingon under. Once again, a lot of this call correlated with how I expect this game to be played. Slower paced. Donovan Klingon going up against a guy of his stature. That is where I think ultimately you get some success from uh, Zach Eady down low. I also think there's a possibility, JVT, that Donovan Klingon could potentially get into foul trouble if he's going one-on-one against Zach Eady. So that would uh, help out in this underplay as well, as we saw with DJ Burns on Saturday. Got into a little bit of foul trouble. Now, DJ Burns, Donovan Klingon, I would say Klingon seems to be a little bit more uh, in shape uh, than DJ Burns, who seemed a bit huffing and puffing uh, in that game. But, you know, for UConn to win this game, they don't necessarily need Donovan Klingon to go off from an offensive standpoint. Mm. They've got plenty of great guards that they could trust in. Tristan Newton, Stefan Castle played tremendously well uh, in that win over Alabama. Uh, you can get Cam Spencer hitting from all, all over. So I don't think Donovan Klingon is a guy that you necessarily need in order for UConn to get the victory. Uh, and I think, honestly, JVT, ultimately for them, I think relying on him uh, just from a defensive standpoint is ultimately where you would like to go. But looking at what Donovan Klingon did against someone like Ryan Kalkbrenner, six points against Creighton on January 17th, uh, 12 points in the game uh, against Creighton on February 20th, uh, against Kansas uh, and um, and, the, and the big boy down there for, uh, for Kansas uh, and Hunter Dickinson, only eight points. So, I think Donovan Klingon struggles a little bit on the offensive side of the ball. So under 13 and a half points for Donovan Klingon, Purdue first half, and then full game under. Uh, certainly, I got it at a better number. So at 144 would be uh, still lean that way, but not necessarily a play that I'm racing to play. Yep. Uh, and for, for me, too, like, yeah, Purdue for the game. We, you know, we've, we've done this for a while now. Uh, going back to that Gonzaga matchup, I've really come along here on Purdue and how well they've played. I think they have everything they need to combat uh, UConn. Um, I think they're more well-equipped, at least, to do it than any of the teams that we've seen them face up to this point, too. So as somebody who's ridden this train, why get off at one last stop, right? Let's see if they can get this thing home. So Purdue for the full game at plus seven. Uh, and, of course, we talked about it, so let's do it. Uh, Zach Eady under one-and-a-half assists at plus 130. 
Uh, going to bet this thing under. Again, I, I agree with the sentiment that this is not like an anti ED thing. It's just more of a strategy thing. I, th- I don't think UConn's going to need to send doubles and open up the floor for assist opportunities for Zach Eady. I think this is going to be a one-on-one battle, and it's going to be one where UConn's going to be at home on a lot of these shooters, and those kick-out opportunities from the post aren't going to be there under one and a half assists and plus 130 for Eady here. So Purdue plus seven, Eady under one and a half assists, plus 130, and then, of course, the Phillies' first five money line, plus 115 over St. Louis. All right, there you go. Those are our bets for the this evening, we have our poll question up at one Tim Murray at me, JVT. What is the most likely outcome for the national championship? 42% of you chiming in on the vote. Think it's a UConn cover, but seven to 10 points. Not a blowout, but you do expect UConn ultimately to cover. 22% of you believe UConn win, but Purdue cover. 16.9% of you believe Purdue wins this game outright. And then 17% of you believe UConn wins Blowout fashion, alt line at minus 10 and a half. So there you go for uh, for this evening, taking a look at it. So we'll continue to update the market. Uh, looks like a little bit of over money now starting to uh, to show up. The 144s are starting to emerge. It got as low as 143 and a half. So we'll see uh, where this ultimately lands. Uh, we'll talk to Matt Grill from behind the counter coming up top of the hour. Because normally in a high profile game like this, JVT, the public is going to want to bet on points. And I would imagine, as we read you uh, the the betting splits, that ultimately they're going to be laying the points with UConn. I, I do want to show, Britton, do we have the graphic uh, from uh, you know looking at the pace of how this game uh, could potentially be played out? Uh, because this is a UConn team that doesn't look like it has really had many issues uh, throughout the year, right? They entered this game with just three losses on the year. So far this year, they have played seven games this season, UConn, at 62 possessions or less. Their ATS record, one and six, straight up, four and three. So all three of their losses at Creighton, at Kansas, at Seton Hall, all came at games that were either 59, 60, or 62 possessions. Now, as is with any stat that is out there, JVT, you got the 63 possessions, that's what they played at against Alabama. Right. They won and covered that game. The arbitrary so, cutoff. Right? Yes, I cut it off at 62 on purpose, uh, but 62 possessions against Creighton in their win, 62 to 48. But also to note that when they play it at slow pace, it has gone under in five of those seven games as well. So I, I continue to believe if Purdue wants to win this game, you don't want to run with a team that has more athletic guards, better guards, pro guards. You're going to want to slow this thing down and make it as limited possession as possible. And I think, too, for you, JVT, as you alluded to, you know what we talked about in the first round plays here in the championship. When you're looking for upset-minded teams like an Oakland in the first round to beat Kentucky, of course, this is a very good three-point shooting team in Purdue, 40% on the year, limited possessions, high, high yeah. three-point shooting team. That could be the recipe to the success. Well, and especially when you're such a highly rated team, right? So you're going to be generally laying pretty big numbers. Fewer possessions means fewer opportunities to cover said number. And then, boom, you're one and six against the spread. Makes sense. All right. Slow it down. Slow it down here. Uh, by the way, Chris Felica pointed out that this point spread will be the highest point spread between two one seeds since 1999 when Duke, as a nine and a half point favorite, lost to UConn. is VSIN Primetime with Tim Murray and Jonathan Von Tobel on VSIN, the sports betting network. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. Download the app, use promo code VSIN when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. Our betting splits of DraftKings Sportsbook are free right now over at vcin.com. 64% of the bets, 70% of the handle currently on UConn laying the seven. Total has now ticked up to 144 at most spots. Uh, actually, has gone back down to 143 and a half. So a little uh, toggling between 144 Ooh. and 143 and a half was as high as 148 and a half at open at DraftKings on 
Saturday night. That's Jonathan Von Tobel. I'm Tim Murray. Top of the hour. We'll get much more from behind the counter. Who will the books ultimately need? Come tip time tonight, Matt Grill from DraftKings Sportsbook is scheduled to join us at the top of the hour. But right now we head to our progressive guest line and bring in at Skating Tripods on social media. It is the one and only Adam Burke. Of course, our own Adam Burke here from VEASAN. Uh, I'll let you two get at the baseball side of things here momentarily. But as we sit here about two hours away from tip time, Adam, UConn and Purdue, I know deep down inside of you, it's all about the group of five. It's about those mid-majors. But we got two big boys going head-to-head tonight. Right now, UConn laying seven. Total, we'll call it 144 consensus. Anything that is piquing your interest for the national championship tonight? Yeah, two big boys going head-to-head literally and figuratively here because obviously this matchup is all about Zach Eady going up against Donovan Klingon. And look, I mean, I'm really curious to see how this game plays out because I feel like UConn's got a big coaching advantage in this game now because Matt Painter can't just have the offense thrown inside to Zach Eady because they finally found a team that might have an answer for Zach Eady. And if Klingon's able to stay out of foul trouble, then UConn should have an answer for him. So guys are going to have to make shots from the outside for Purdue. They've done a really good job of doing that throughout the course of the season. They're a top five team in three point percentage, but obviously it's a much different game here when you're playing in a football stadium like they are. I know they've played a game there. I know they've had some shoot arounds and practices, stuff like that. Look, I mean, when you look at the metric sites, when you look at Bart Torvik, Ken Palm, Hasla metrics, they all have this in the two and a half to three range. And as we know, the market is much higher than that. And I still can't take Purdue. I just, I can't force myself to take the Boilermakers here, even though, you know, in our own Tyler Shoemaker even has this UConn minus three. I can't take Purdue. The only thing I did was put a little bit of money on the under for the first half, me and apparently everybody else in the world, it would appear. But that's the only thing I have for tonight. I think UConn probably wins. I don't know how much they win by, but I think it probably will be a lower scoring game at least for a while. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. All right, we appreciate that. I don't thank you very much. All right, let's go to the transition over to baseball then. Um, first off, I know that you've got something cooking here in a game that's about to start. So walk us through Toronto and Seattle and what you're looking at. Yeah, so I, I just like Toronto, or excuse me, I like Seattle in this game as a slight underdog here in this one. Kind of even money out there in the marketplace is what you're looking at now. Jose Barrios has not looked good you know, through his two starts. While the results have been good, he's given up a lot of hard hit contact and then from start one to start two, wound up with a velocity drop. And with the rash of pitcher injuries that we're seeing, I'm paying very close attention to velocity drops, spin rate drops, stuff like that. Maybe Barrios isn't fully healthy. I don't know. But I don't think that there's really a whole lot of upside for him right now, despite the results that we've seen to this point. And I think Luis Castillo has a ton of upside in this game because Toronto is a very right-handed heavy lineup. Castillo's a guy that is remarkably good against right-handed hitters, both home and on the road. So I think Seattle has a little bit of an upper hand here in this one due in large part to the pitching matchup. But again, I also think that maybe there's something going on there a little bit with Barrios to where, you know, I think that we're going to see some regression in his numbers if that velocity doesn't spike back up. Maybe it will. This game is pitching, you know, is in a controlled environment there at the Rogers Center. So, you know, maybe the the lack of conditions will help him out. But I think Castillo has a big advantage here over uh, Barrios. And then I also think that Toronto missing two of their top relievers in Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson. They're kind of up against it a little bit. So I went ahead and played the full game where I got a little bit more value on the Seattle side. All right. I know you got a player prop in Arizona, Colorado. So when I ask you this question, then extension, you can get into that too. But what do we do with Gallon from last year? The road home road splits were so weird. He was terrible on the road. Now he's out here at Coors taking on Kyle Freeland in the lowly Rockies dollar 70 favorite. Yeah, and the thing about Zach Allen, too, is he's come out and had a velocity decrease here early on in the season as well. And and last year, the hard hit percentage was really, really high. Obviously, he had a significant workload pitching all the way into the World Series that added you know some extra innings on the back end of his season. Gallon was a guy I lost some money on trying to fade in the middle part of last year because the contact management numbers suggested that he was getting a little bit lucky. But Arizona is an elite defensive team, and, and for whatever reason, he was getting his strikeouts at the right time to keep those runners from scoring. I'm not super confident in him today at Coors Field, but also I'm never confident in the Rockies. So, you know, for me, what I looked at here was Arizona's team total over two and a half for the first five. It was very juicy this morning at minus 150. Some shops have maybe even moved up to three and a half at this point, but they're going up against Kyle Freeland. And Kyle Freeland has not only been horrific this season, but the Diamondbacks have been really good against left-handed pitching. And they project as a lineup that should be really good against left-handed pitching. They weren't last year. 
They picked up a guy like Eugenio Suarez. He's the guy with some pop that can hit against the thin side of the platoon. So I think that they're well positioned to do well here against Kyle Freeland. That's why I was willing to lay the minus 150 on that team total. And as always, shop around. I mean, I'm sure there were some alternative numbers out there that maybe were a little bit lower on the juice or maybe three and a half plus money, something like that. The weather's not great in Denver tonight, so the ball's probably not going to carry all that well. It's going to be cool, wind blowing in a little bit, but there's a lot of space in that outfield, JVT, and Kyle Freeland just doesn't miss bats. So I think the Diamondbacks manufacture some runs here tonight in the first five. Adam Burke and Dustin Sweetelson give you the Double Play bod- podcast, so make sure you check that out. Double Play, a baseball podcast is the exact name of it wherever you get your podcasts. Adam joins us right now on our Progressive Guest Line. All right, Adam, not to make you sad here, but uh, we got the news over the weekend. Shane Bieber done for the year with Tommy John. Uh, the Guardians obviously have gotten off to a, a great start to the season, sitting at 7-2. and two. What does this mean moving forward for the AL Central with Bieber being out the rest of the year? Yeah, I think it's a really fair question. I mean, look, there's two ways you can look at this, and we talked about this a little bit on the Double Play Pod. The first is you didn't really know what you were going to get out of Shane Bieber this season. The fact that he went to driveline baseball in the offseason looked so good in spring training and then looked really, really good in his first two starts. I know people downplayed the first one because it was Oakland, but you know he was very dominant against Seattle in that second start as well. Cleveland, you know, if you're going to lose a key guy, it's better that they lose a pitcher because they've got Logan Allen, Tanner Bybee, Gavin Williams is on his way back. Tristan McKenzie, the velocity was up a little bit here today in his start against the White Sox. So, you know, they'll find pitching. That's what they do. That's what good teams, data-driven organizations are able to do. With that being said, I mean, the way that Beaver was throwing the ball and the season looked like he was poised to have, you know, he looked like he was in pretty good shape. In terms of what this does for the AL Central race, I don't think the Twins are all that good, and they're not playing all that well here right now. The Tigers are, you know, a team kind of on the rise, but again, they're offensively challenged, much like Cleveland is. And as this season goes along, Cleveland will call up Kyle Manzardo probably in a couple of weeks here, and Chase DeLauder should be up in the spring. This offense will get better as this season goes along. I would say even with the Beaver injury, I'm still optimistic about Cleveland's chances in the AL Central. Maybe the Twins wake up and figure it out, but you know I, I think Cleveland has a higher upside than Detroit based on what we've seen here so far and based on kind of projecting things going forward. All right, so speaking of waking up, we'll get you out of here on this. Uh, teams like the New York Metropolitans, they get Charlie Morton and the Braves today. Um, the numbers, Some of the underlying numbers would suggest that this lineup's getting a little unlucky. So how do we handle a team like that from a betting perspective? You just continue to play them until it evens out. Do you wait to see that thing wake up? What do you do with a team like New York? It seems to be getting pretty unlucky on balls in play. Well, I don't know if I'd back him with Julio Tehran on the mound, but, you know, a guy that continues to find work and, you know, as injuries keep happening, I'm sure we'll hear some other names like him come out of the woodwork here. Yeah, I mean, from an underlying metric standpoint, this is an offense that has gotten a little bit unlucky at this point in time. And, you know, typically those things do tend to even out, at least to some degree. But also, you know, this is something we talked about in the double play pod as well. These organizations that don't really seem to have a lot of continuity, don't really seem to have an identity, uh, you know, a clear direction of where they're going those things can leak over to the field and those things can really fester and really hang around for a long period of time. So while the, st- while the statistics suggest that the Mets should be getting better, I don't know if all these guys are real thrilled every day to come to the ballpark. So I think that's one of the things that you know is not exactly quantifiable, but something that I've been trying to keep in mind a little bit more here that just because the stats say it's going to turn and I am a big data driven guy, there are external factors in play. And for right now, the Mets just seem like a team that you know, they, nobody really seems to be on the same page at any level of the organization. Yep. Adam Burke at Skating Tripods on Twitter. Of course, check out Double Play, a baseball podcast. He and Dustin Sweetelson, wherever you get your podcast. Adam, always appreciate it, man. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Have a good one. There he is, Adam Burke, joining us on our progressive guest line and uh, looking a little bit at a first half under in the national championship game tonight. What has the action been like so far? For tonight's national championship, we go behind the counter and talk to Matt Grill from DraftKings Sportsbook at the top of the hour. That's Jonathan Von Tobel. I'm Tim Murray. It is V-CIN primetime on a championship Monday where UConn still a seven-point favorite over the Boilermakers of Purdue.